This is Keys to the Shop, episode 286, Coffee Roasting Best Practices with Scott Rayo. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. I really appreciate you tuning in today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, I would encourage you to hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll always be up to date with new episodes. We come out with about 10 or so every month. So there's a lot of great content coming to you on a regular basis. And don't forget also to share these episodes with a friend or with your team or someone that you think can really benefit from the content. And finally, if you've really been helped by this show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star rating or review over at Apple Podcasts. That really helps the show in the rankings, helps it get out there and more people to find it. Thank you so much, everybody who's already done that. Now, on top of doing this podcast, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. Whether you're just getting started in the coffee industry and need an advisor to help you avoid needless mistakes and build foundations for the future of your business, or you just want to level up your operations, your quality, and your people, there are a lot of ways that Keys to the Shop Consulting can help you either through remote consultation or on-site training and assessment I would love to talk with you about what might fit for your situation. All you have to do to set up a free discovery call is email me, chris at keys to the and we can talk about what you've got going on and see if working with Keys to the Shop Consulting is the right fit for you. Again, that email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the best specialty coffee equipment suppliers in the world because not only do they give you an incredible selection of the best small wares and commercial equipment available anywhere in the world, but they also work closely with you to make sure you're getting the right equipment for your needs. At Prima Coffee, they are all about your success in specialty coffee. And right now, since you're a Keys to the Shop listener, you can get 5% off your entire order over at prima-coffee.com slash keys by just using the promo code KEYS5 at checkout. That's K-E-Y-S, the number five at checkout. And you get 5% off your entire order at prima-coffee.com slash keys. That's a huge deal. Uh, And this is a really great company to partner with when you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment and want to work with the best. Again, go to their website to find out more at prima-coffee.com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series, the worldwide leader in amazing plant-based performance beverages that actually perform on bar because they're designed for baristas. They are subjected to a lot of scrutiny by some of the world's best baristas before they even make it onto your counter. And that means no matter what you choose from the extensive lineup that the Barista Series offers, you can rest assured that it stands up to the heat from steaming, produces amazing texture for latte art, and will keep the beverage focused on your amazing coffee. And that's what your customers are there for. They want a quality plant-based beverage. And the key to being able to do that, I think, is using the Barista Series. Go to their website to find out more information over at pacificfoodservice.com. Get them in your store and try them for yourself. Again, if you're wanting to serve your customers the best plant-based beverages, then you need to be using the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, to okay, everybody. Okay, everyone. Well, today is a big day because we get to have a conversation with the legend himself, Scott Rayo. I've known Scott for quite a long time. I uh, actually got an autographed uh, copy of his book, uh, The Professional Barista's Handbook, from way back when, the early 2000s. I mean, Scott Rayo has been in the coffee business for over 25 years as a, a cafe owner, a roaster, consultant, and author of many books, including The Coffee Roaster's Companion and Coffee Roasting Best Practices, uh, which we're going to be discussing today. And these books have really influenced a generation of roasters and shaped the global roasting vocabulary and conversations. Uh, Scott's popular Instagram account, at whereisscottrayo, offers expert-level tips and discussion about coffee brewing and roasting. And I'll tell you that Scott is one of these people that really gets the industry thinking and discussing things, whether that's calmly and analytically or a heated discussion. He has certainly been able to influence great many people in the direction of quality coffee. And today we're going to be talking in depth with Scott about his book, Coffee Roasting Best Practices. And not only will we discuss things like uh, what roast curves can and can't tell you, how to approach a new coffee, factoring in moisture levels in roasting, what the development time ratio is, and other technical aspects of the book. But we're also going to be talking about 
mindsets, and philosophies in coffee roasting that have shifted over the years, and some really helpful advice and how we can be thinking about it now to bring us further along into the future. Of course, there's going to be so many great takeaways from this interview, so let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation on coffee roasting best practices with Scott Rayo. Well, Scott, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Such an honor to have you on the show. How are you doing? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to hear from you, Chris. I remember the last time that you and I were face to face. We're not face to face now, but uh, was it must have been 15, 20 years ago, right? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Probably in Ithaca, but um, I'm not sure if it's. It might have been like a throwdown in Pittsburgh where you like signed my copy of your first book. Oh, <laughs> could be. <laughs> Very well, could be. Um, well, anyway, a lot's changed in the industry. A lot of things have stayed the same. Um, You've been around the world teaching roasters to roast coffee better and giving them kind of best practices. It's the title of your new book, um, uh, mm -hmm. Roasting Best Practices. And so um, this is kind of uh, going to be an in-depth conversation, I think. And so I, I, my first question to start off, I suppose, is like, how did you begin to seriously pursue and research best practices for coffee roasting? Well, uh, I started in the in the mid '90s, and of course, back then we didn't have any any data logging software like Cropster or Artisan, and I kept a lot of handwritten logbooks. I mean, uh, boxes and boxes of these binders, and tried to record all of the settings and temperature data. But but I didn't really know much what to do with it. Um, there are there are a few things here and there that seem to correlate with better cups, and then. And then when the data logging software came around, I was pretty determined to, to figure out how to make use of that data to make my roasting better. Um, around that time, a couple of years later, I was doing a consulting job for a reasonably large specialty roaster. And it was, it was my first kind of big real job. And I was, I was pretty nervous. And when I got there, uh, the staff did not want me there. It was clear the boss wanted me there and the staff took offense to my being there. They just, they felt like I was, they felt like, you know, I was, I was potentially stepping on their toes. And so after the first day with them, I, I stayed up, you know, most of the night pouring over their, their roasting data and, and all the roast that we, that we roasted and, and cupped. And I, I noticed a few things that, that correlated well with the best roasts. And I was, I was really motivated to mine their data and find, find the best way to roast their coffee and, and at least, you know, make some, make some big enough improvements that the staff would, would be won over. And the next day we, we cupped, we roasted again, we cupped the coffees and the boss had a cup of his uh, Ethiopian and he sat down with it and he just didn't talk for about 10 minutes and he just, he just enjoyed the coffee. And he, and afterward he said, you know what? I didn't know my coffee could taste that good. And that was, that was kind of the beginning of my serious deep dive into roasting data and, and practices because, because that, that kind of high pressure moments with that company. Really interesting. So from there, it, it, obviously you, you, you touched the nerve and, or an untapped area of, of data logging and, and, and data mining and just kind of connecting things that maybe, you know, in production roasting, you don't either have time to connect or, you know, you have the motivation to do so. I mean, a, a lot has changed, like you said, over the years, and now we have access to more technology and the culture is a little bit more geared towards that. So it might be hard for some mm -hmm. people to imagine that there was a time where that just was, you know, something you collected in a binder and didn't do as much with as we do today. But, you know, mm -hmm. from what you've been involved with since then to now, I mean, what shifts have you seen in coffee and coffee roasting uh, that you would consider sort of major shifts? I, I'd say a few of the big ones that come to mind. Uh, of course, in, in our careers, we've seen roasters, you know, uh, specialty roasters choose to go a lot lighter. And I think that's really been the pivotal change because back when people roasted darker, they weren't quite as concerned about the nuance in the cup or, or the particulars of roasting. And the lighter we got, the more those, those details became uh, quite, quite important in, in getting the most out of coffee. And, and of course, third wave type people were, were buying more and more expensive coffees and, and that kind of went hand in hand with the lighter roasting and the more meticulous attention to detail. So I think that's, that's of course a big one. Uh, the introduction of data logging software is, is a huge one for roasters because in in my experience, in in the ten 
plus years that I that I was roasting and and the software didn't quite exist yet. I felt like roasters weren't making progress. Uh, even even some of the best roasters I knew, they they really had a system and they lacked a lot of the data and the feedback that they would have needed to make progress. And I felt like we were just kind of going in circles and experimenting, but not really making much forward progress. And the software changed all that. The software kind of opened up so much information that we could mine to to potentially learn from. Um, and then and then the last thing that might be a bit of a surprise is that. I think that prior to around the time I wrote my first book on roasting, it was very difficult to get people to talk about roasting. It was a bit secretive. I think people were a little defensive. Maybe everyone felt a little insecure about it. I think a few people felt like they knew something everyone else didn't know and they were going to keep it a secret. And I felt like one of my goals in writing the book, I I knew I wasn't writing a book that was going to lead you to roast perfect coffee but I did want to write a book that kind of cracked open that conversation because it just wasn't happening and it needed to happen. I think that worked. I think I think people definitely began discussing roasting a lot more publicly um, after around that time. Oh, certainly. And I like the comment about insecurities and sort of you know putting a lot more stock in a particular uh, metric or, or trick or twist that you put on your coffee because, like you said, if you weren't making much progress, this is like a black box of information. You don't know what you did. You just know that you discovered something. It feels like you just like went into a field and found gold and, and all of a sudden you get paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, an interesting, if I may, if I may, an interesting thing about roasting without software is that you or I could could say, all right, I'm going to use these gas settings at, at these temperatures and this airflow. So we know all of our inputs, but we don't really know the details of the output. In other words, you can you can taste your coffee, and that's that's the output. But the in between stuff, like like what what exactly went on in that roast curve during during that batch, and what were the details? Because unfortunately, when you come back tomorrow and use those same exact gas and airflow settings, you may end up with a slightly different curve due to ambient conditions, different things you do between batches, a, a whole host of factors. And the software kind of opened everyone's eyes to the whole, oh, I use the same settings every day and they sometimes work and they sometimes don't. But now I kind of see that there's all these other little factors and nuances that I have to accommodate. Yeah, yeah, that that's such a huge shift for sure. And now that we've been living with a new standard, a higher standard um, amongst more people, um, how, how do you go about now taking all of the uh, things that have been discovered, crowdsourced and, and experienced by you in particular, and discovering what is a best practice, like testing and assessing best practices uh, for this book? Right. So... The, the unfortunate thing is that um, roasting is is far from linear, right? It's it's so systemic that I don't think any of us, even even the smartest people I know, I think it's very hard to wrap your head around the, the entire system and all the factors that, that matter at any given moment. And so my, my approach is, is more of a, a big data approach rather than a, a quote unquote scientific approach um, in the sense that if you go into uh, two batches. And in one of them, you say, I'm going to use a charge temperature of 420. And one of them, you say, I'm going to do everything else the same, but charge at 400. You didn't really change just one variable. You changed the temperature of the machine's drum. You changed the the arc of your roast curve. And you changed your air temperature a bit, most likely. So it's kind of impossible to do that A versus B comparison with one variable changing in different roast batches. But um, my my early approach that felt right to me was to look at data from literally thousands of batches and and their ratings in terms of, of flavor and, and quality and to say what decisions seemed to correlate most with the best, not just the good roast, but the best roast, the roast that really stood out. And And then over the years, I tried to winnow down what seemed to have the most impact most often, because I, I don't think you can really master it. And I think it's too complex to really write a formula, but you can you can find certain kind of landmarks in your roasting practices that seem to give you the best chance of success the most frequently. All things being equal, you know, there, there's some things that will more likely give you a good result than others. And, and that's a best practice. Yes, exactly. Okay. And 
uh, yeah, I mean, as, as a, for instance, uh, a certain between batch protocol that helps you reset the thermal energy of your roasting machine is a huge part of a, a best practice in the sense that you can do whatever you want with that. You can, you can roast dark, you can roast light, you can, you can get what you want, but you'll, you'll only be able to do that predictably and consistently if you in fact start every batch with the machine at a predictable identical thermal energy to what you were using before. And, and so every, one thing affects another. And so you, you just have to try to figure out how, you know, to consider those things when you're making those changes, um, which, uh, and I kind of want to get into some of uh, the book here in our, our discussion uh, today there's so much information available to us in roasting and in this book. I mean, how should we expect to divide our time and energy between gaining knowledge about coffee and our machinery uh, to set up parameters compared with um, just trial and error? Sure. I mean, you, you definitely need a bit of both. Um, I, I think we don't have enough of a, a concrete system. No one does really to, to avoid trial and error. Right. So when um, we're looking at trying to set up a pr uh, protocol for our roasting, um, it would be mm -hmm. good to you know, just study a bit. Um, but you could, I guess, sure. study excessively and just not make decisions because you're afraid of making uh, mistakes in your roasting. So I guess, y you know, would it be kind of like 50-50, like you, you really should do these best practices, but then some of, you know, what's going to fill in the nuances and the blanks here is going to be based on your ecosystem is in your roasting operation. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the bigger risk is I meet a lot of uh, roasters who, whether they, they've just hired me or, or, or they were, were about to hire me and, and I was asking them about their, their system, they, they seem to experiment almost too much. So er everyone seems to be in search of a system and something to anchor them, but, but the tinkering gets a little out of control. And then, and then we end up kind of back where we were in the 90s, where we're kind of going in circles and, and not making forward progress. Um, so I think, you know, the, the key really is to, I don't necessarily have all the answers for you, but I, I, I try to create a system, an ecosystem of sorts that will give you a framework that you can then make adjustments to based on the coffee and based on your taste. But that framework will serve you well, hopefully, in terms of roasting predictably and consistently and meeting your goals. Great. Yeah. So the, the theme is just don't let the coffee uh, knowledge and data take you back to the 90s. <laughs> yes, pr pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, it's <laughs> it's analogous to when when we started using the coffee refractometer, I definitely would not say, oh, you know, every 24% extraction tastes better than every 20% extraction. But being able to track how various methods and choices in brewing affected the cup result in terms of both flavor and extraction kind of gave us a new dimension that, that highlighted a lot of things and, and gave a lot of hints as to which direction to go in, which is, which is quite invaluable. From the book, when we're at, in our roasteries, we want to roast a coffee that we are looking to start off on the right foot. We're t approaching a new coffee is one of the parts you go over in the book. Um, what are a couple of the most influential elements that we should be aware of when doing that? The most critical ones. Yeah, I know that that's a great question, and I think it's a much it's a much needed question because if you, if you go on the internet. And, and you start reading up on, on forums, people just say, well, depends on the coffee. But, but, but people necessarily say, well, what is it about the coffee that matters that it makes it depend on the coffee? Is it something about the varietal? Is it something about the growing conditions? Is it the altitude? Is it the bean size and physical traits? And I, I think while, while all, the, all of that matters, I think the if you forced me to, to limit it to two, I would surprise people and I would say that bean size and bean moisture content are the two most influential factors when deciding how to approach a bean, because those are the two factors that have the greatest impact on how much gas you need to apply to develop that bean to a certain degree. So uh, think of it a little bit like this. If you, if you put two different sized loaves of bread in the oven at the same time, the small one would cook faster, right? The, the smaller one effectively right. needed less energy to get to the same place. And while everyone wants to talk about whether washed coffees need more gas than naturals or whether you need a special approach for this type of coffee or, or that, 
they're, they're often missing the, the very simple physics of smaller objects need less time or less temperature or just effectively less energy to develop or to you know heat through and through to a certain degree than larger ones do. And that's that's the overwhelming. If you if you if I had to know only one thing about a coffee before roasting it, I would I would ask the size of the bean. Are there exceptions to that in terms of density? So density is a is a player in this, but the way I see it is that if we are only talking about high quality specialty coffee, the difference in density from bean to bean is usually quite small. So for instance, uh, the difference between your the density of your favorite Colombian and, and Kenya that you've tasted recently, the density difference might be 10 or 20 percent at the most. Perhaps you have a Brazil that you use that's like a lower grade of specialty that, that the density is, is a little lower still, maybe maybe 30 percent or something like that. But your pea berry might only be about one quarter of the size of your agogite. Right. So you, you might be looking at a difference of 300 percent rather than 30 percent. Mm-hmm. So the, the magnitude of the differences that we're talking about is, is the key. So it's not necessarily that I'm not saying on an apples to apples basis that size, moisture or density. I'm not saying which one's impor- more important. But what I am saying is that for our purposes, we deal with such a wide array of bean sizes and a modest array of. Uh, moisture content, but a pretty small range of density. So if you had a, uh, for instance, a pie chart, I would, I would give 80% of the importance in my pie chart to, to bean size, perhaps 15% to moisture content, or perhaps 5% to density. Um, okay. If that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. And so, um, in terms of moisture content, I mean, that will directly impact things like, you know, when first crack happens, et cetera. Like what, what are the direct uh, correlations between uh, th- that you've seen or most common in the difference between something that doesn't have a lot of moisture and something that does? Sure. So, so back in the mid nineties, I, I had a roastery in, in Massachusetts and, and, and uh, we would have, as you know, quite, quite hot, humid summers and, and very cold, dry winters. Mm-hmm. And back then coffee wasn't stored in plastic it was just stored in in burlap so it was exposed to the elements and what i what i didn't think about was that keeping the green in my cafe slash roastery in the winter the the green coffee was going to dry out steadily over over several weeks and months and what was happening was my roasts were getting faster and faster and they were tasting less fruity and and more kind of hollow and, and woody and it eventually dawned on me that I was losing so much moisture from the green coffee, am- among other things, but that moisture loss was making the coffee roast a lot faster for, for a given set of gas settings. So that's really number one is that the, the moisture that comes out of the beans is, even though moisture is a good conductor of heat within the beans, the moisture that leaves the beans acts as a little bit of a, a force field that inhibits the heat transfer from the hot air to the bean surfaces. So the more moisture you have in the bean, the more moisture you're going to release during a roast. And the more moisture you release, the more gas or the more heat effectively you need to overcome that resistance of that little force field. Right. That makes a lot of sense. It's almost like a, the, it's like blooming coffee when you're brewing it. Yeah. So, you know, much, much like coffee grounds, you know, I think, I think when people are beginners in roasting, they sometimes forget Roasting coffee is is not like roasting a bunch of little uh, you know wooden balls in in an, in an oven or something like that. It, not not a, like a bunch of little inert things. Like the coffee is actually releasing a ton of moisture and expanding and becoming more porous. So there's there's kind of a back and forth where the the coffee isn't just the recipient of the action. Sometimes the coffee is the initiator of the action. When it comes to the moisture again. Um, you mentioned that the changing moisture in the coffee in your roastery, for example, was a was due to ambient environment, right? Time mm-hmm. as you mm-hmm. store the coffee. Uh, coming from the farm, though, I mean, is there a great variation? Like, well, how much of a variation sh- should we be expecting in terms of moisture content based on coffee that's just fresh coffee, fresh green? Good quality coffee is almost always in the range of eight to twelve percent moisture. 
uh, we we generally try to not keep it above 12 percent because the the risk of microbial overgrowth over over you know several months of storage is, is pretty high you don't want to grow mold or, or such in your coffee uh, below eight percent coffee I haven't had it too often but I do believe coffee can taste quite good below eight percent but it, it does run the risk of sometimes having a bit of like a, a straw like uh, flatness and hollowness um, and I, I haven't had many coffees other than Ethiopians that happen to taste delicious at extremely low moisture levels. Um, so I would say, you know, eight to 12% is, is your normal range. And if you think about it, 12% is, is 50% higher than 8%. So going back to that discussion about how much gas do you need to roast the coffee, the, the bean size might be a 300% range. The moisture content is a 50% range. Okay. And then within the ambient environment, I mean, we have better controls over, um, our environments now, I think. Uh, people would shudder to think of some of the ro conditions in roasting. When I worked for a, yeah. a roaster in upstate New York, um, I remember uh, John Gant at Gimme Coffee um, on the mm -hmm. Civets mm -hmm. Roaster roasting in what I would consider one of those walk-in ovens they have at those bread companies. It was just amazing and <laughs> hot in there. And, and that was the way it was done. That was the romance of it. But now we have, you know, mostly, <laughs> I'd say, air conditioned. So there's roasters out there that are being like, oh my, not me. But um, yep, yep. that that uh, has to have some level of uh, predictable impact on the moisture content that you might be able to account for and track. Is that the kind of thing that you would recommend people do is like just take moisture level readings of your coffee based on how long you're storing them? Yes. So I, I want to put in the caveat here that that most of us in specialty coffee are now buying almost all or all of our coffee in Grain Pro or, or other hermetically sealed packages. So this has become less of an issue in my consulting over the years because effectively the moisture doesn't change if the Grain Pro bag is is intact. Um, in, in situations where people buy coffee that's not in plastic, I do recommend that they take a moisture reading from their green every week or two and, and note if it's changing because that would give them a, a chance to predict Oh, my moisture dropped a bit. I might need to use a little bit less gas right. today. Right. Um, and you also you also get to learn a little bit about how your storage environment is affecting your green and what conditions would stabilize it and, and which ones wouldn't. And uh, like for instance, when I had that cafe back when, because we didn't have coffee in in plastic bags, what I did was the kind of thing someone like me would do is I went out and I bought a four thousand dollar industrial humidifier and I put it in my cafe roastery and I figured out eventually what settings I needed to be at in terms of, of temperature and humidity in the room so that the moisture content of the green neither went up nor down and we didn't develop any mold uh, nice. around where the beans were stored. Um, so it took, it took a little doing, but it was actually a really fun project and, and I learned a lot doing that. When we're looking at these factors and others, you're talking in the book about setting parameters for your roasting. And obviously, we're going to change these over time as we pay attention to um, the idiosyncrasies of, of our operations. But um, mm -hmm. talking about defining uh, reasonable standards and parameters uh, for, for the mm -hmm. roasting, I mean, what, how do you define mm -hmm. reasonable and then unreasonable? <laughs> yes, um, that's a great question. So... Um, I could I could say you know I know it when I see it but um, no so um, <laughs> uh, I think I think the keys are that be, before I dive into any kind of numbers or anything like that I want to point out that so much depends on what machine you're using how much burner power it has and what batch size you choose because I could I could make a case for a sample roaster with 100 grams in it, uh, doing a beautiful six-minute sample roast, but but then another case that if you're putting 10 kilos of coffee in a 12 kilo probot, you would never want to try to roast it in six minutes. It just won't work. And and so that's that's the context people need. Is first they have to step back and say, what's my machine? How much power does it have? How much coffee am I going to put in it? And then once you've made those decisions, the range of what what is reasonable becomes a little bit easier to define. So, for instance, you know, for most of us, production roasting at 60, 70 percent of a machine's capacity, roasting in nine to 12 minutes is, is quite reasonable. 
you could certainly go a little faster, a little bit slower, but uh, if I just had to pick a, a target range for most people and when they're beginners, I would say, you know, aim, aim for that range and, and be happy if you're in that range and, and don't, don't over worry about time once you've, once you've settled into the reasonable range. And, and the same holds true for things like charge temperature or how your roast curve should shape and, and things like that. There are, there are boundaries that are, are best practices that if you can find yourself within those boundaries pretty much all the time, you can, you can stop worrying too much. You, you don't have to obsess over the perfect level of airflow. You have to find a reasonable level of airflow that serves your purposes, et cetera. So would you say unreasonable is defined as being overly uh, nitpicky about it or and also careless? Um, I mean, un unreasonable to me um, usually comes about because, yeah, because of carelessness or because of I don't want to deal with all that systematic stuff. I just want to do it my way. And, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes it's 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 actually... Um, a lot of what I consider unreasonable trends in coffee roasting over the years came from machine manufacturers who either didn't know better or were trying to make up for design problems with the machine. Like for instance, like one company used to put out very, very underpowered machines for years. Like the burner would literally have about 25% of the power that, that their modern machines have mm -hmm. for the same machine size. And so some of their advice involved roasting for 40 minutes <laughs> and 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 that was that was really common in the in the late 80s early 90s and it was also touted as a as a way of making coffee taste better yeah, and know. what a lot of people didn't realize was that, that was kind of an unreasonable recommendation that was a workaround for a flawed machine so that, that kind of circular um situation happens all the time yeah and it can happen just within your own in between your ears too <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure it happens between mine all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Trust me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're talking about roast curves. I know I, I see a lot of postings about roast curves. There's a lot of debate about roast curves and looking at the, res the results of uh, a roast and determining next actions based on them. Um, you've mentioned mm -hmm. that a couple of times so far. How... How much can be predicted from the roast curve, and how much is a mystery, really? Right. That's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I want to start by saying you can't look at a roast curve and say, oh, I know this coffee is going to taste like blueberries. Like, that would, be, that would be insane. That'll never happen, right? You also, interestingly, can't look at a roast curve and have confidence about whether the roast is well-developed at the, core, the cores of the beans. Uh, unless you have a tremendous amount of context, you're very familiar with the coffee, you've used that roasting machine before, you might have a, you know, a guess about the development. But if you just showed me a random curve and said, is this coffee well developed, I would have no idea. And the reason for that is that the temperature readings we're getting are all coming from the surface of the beans, but they don't tell us what's going on in the centers of the beans. So, so you may have reasonable things happening at the surface, but you may not have actually succeeded in penetrating uh, the beans, especially on a light roast. So that's, that's things that the curves can't tell you. What the curves can tell you are, are roast effects and, and defects in the sense of if your ROR is um, going along you know, rather horizontal and then suddenly takes a very sharp vertical dive right after first crack begins, we call this a crash. And the crash will often lead to some of the juicier, rounder, fruitier notes of the coffee being being flattened and, and hollowed out a bit. They'll, they'll, they'll taste, uh, at the worst, they'll taste kind of cardboardy or, or like straw. Um, Chris, have you ever had a coffee on the cupping table that was, that was acidic and sweet when it was hot, but then when you came back and it was room temperature, it had lost all of that and it just seemed kind of hollow? So, so many times. Okay. So actually, it's interesting because I had a conversation with a green buyer friend of mine about this recently. And I said, I said, that's, that's not the coffee's fault. It's actually due to baked roasting. And he was, he was quite surprised. And then, and then we did a little comparative cupping to demonstrate it. And he was like, this is kind of mind blowing because I rejected a lot of coffees over the years because of that, but it may not have actually been the green coffee's fault. Wow. So your, your roast curve can tell you a lot of that. And there's something we call the flick, which 
can happen at, usually at the end of a roast where the ROR, the rate of rise, begins to rise. So it's like a re-acceleration of the roast. And that almost always leads to what I call undue roastiness in the sense that even if it's a light roast, it might taste roasty. And in almost any situation, the coffee is going to taste a little bit roastier and perhaps charred more so than, than whatever level of roast you actually wanted from the coffee. And you would say that usually that would be considered something not desirable. Right. So I, I always preface my, my books and my consulting with, you know, what I'm here to teach is something systematic and something that leads to clean, sweet, well-developed coffee. And and I am aware that, that that's not always everyone's goals. And and sometimes uh, people really enjoy baked coffee or, or even flicked coffee. Um, and, you know, just like you and I probably drank darker coffee 25 years ago than we do now. Yeah. And probably if probably 25 years ago, if we drank whatever we drank this morning, if we had it 25 years ago, we would have said it was sour. So mm-hmm. tastes change, goals vary. Um, but, you know, my 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 effort really is in helping people to meet their goals and helping people to achieve consistency and good development within whatever parameters they they want in terms of flavor and the type of coffee they buy and all that. Yeah. Well, that's reasonable. And in so I think it's so interesting that you know, comment that was made about rejecting so many coffees because of a uh, uh, mistake made in the roasting process or or not mm-hmm. really bringing out the best in the coffee because you know the conversation today we're having a lot about sustainability and and um, collaboration with people on the farm level so many people's tastes are based on what is represented on the cupping table big decisions yeah. are made at the cupping table and it would behoove us to have best practices to eliminate the possibility that we are rejecting something that should actually have been given a chance Yes. Actually, I'd love to tell you two anecdotes about that that happened yeah. recently. Um, one is that I was I was at an importer's in New York a couple of weeks ago, and they presented me some some very nice coffees that they admittedly were roasted quite badly in, in a sample roaster. And and we, we talked a lot about effectively how to how to semi automate a, a sample roaster like the one that they that they sell, because because of this exact problem, like at the, at the farm level. With with old style sample roasters, you, you'll never achieve consistency, and you'll you'll never have a good transparent look at the quality of your roast because no one's no one's using data, no one's got any feedback loops. Like it's 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 too difficult. It's 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 too it's too much of a leap from where they're at now. They don't have the controls on their machines. So we actually talked about starting a project where he's going to adapt his sample roaster to use a, a semi-automated gas system that that already exists out there with with Cropster and Artisan and we're going to adapt it for um, like a tablet computer that we could easily get for for a hundred bucks and attach it to the roasters so that you don't need a laptop with your roaster etc and we could actually kind of sell it as a package with with a bunch of presets and a bunch of options for for manual control in an effort to help people at origin actually represent their copies as well as they can. Oh, it makes a lot um, of sense. So that's that's one thing, and I think I think that'll that'll happen in the future, one way or another, with or without us. And the other the other little anecdote was that um, so I've been doing this new project with my friend Ryan Brown. It's called Facsimile, and we we source four different coffees each month, and we send it out. And Ryan does a, a couple long video with our subscribers every month, where where he and a guest coffee expert cup together online and talk about their cupping routine. They talk about the coffees in front of them, et cetera. And Ryan's an, Ryan's an excellent cupper and scorer, and he's sampling about 40 or 50 samples a month. Now, my friend Mark does the sample roasting, and we always get 200 grams of samples from the importers, and we, we do two 100-gram sample roasts. Now, as every roaster knows, the very first time you roast a coffee is a little bit random, and you don't really know what to expect. And so Mark is is excellent and systematic, but you know maybe maybe a third of his first tries are are not so great on these copies. And in, in any case, his second try is always better because he always learns from the first batch. So we started sending the really bad first batches to Ryan along with the good second batches. And Ryan asks us to never label anything in a way that might bias him. He doesn't want to know what he's cupping. He doesn't want to know anything 
other than just this is sample number five, basically. And so he, unbeknownst to him, was cupping the same coffee roasted poorly and roasted well on on countless occasions. And his scoring differential was not only consistent because he always cups more than one cup of each coffee on the table and he doesn't know where the pair of each cup is. He doesn't know where its twin is. So he's he's always double blinding himself like that. Um, his differential just based on the roast quality of those coffees averaged over 1.5 points, mm. which going from 85 to 86 and a half or something like that is kind of monumental in terms of uh, whether someone would buy a copy, how much they would pay for it, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we, we're learning a lot through this process of, of doing things kind of carefully and using, using so many blinding mechanisms to make sure that we're duplicating our results and, and not knowing what's going on. Wow. And the moral of the story is that a lot of people would just sample roast a coffee and do it once and, and just cup that one. And they would have that point differential just, uh, inherently and not even realize it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I think to be fair to everyone, roasters and green buyers out there, None of us can fully separate the effects of green coffee quality and roast quality because they, they, you know, they're tied together by chemistry. There's no, there are, there are certain effects that you can point to and say that was mostly due to the roast, that was mostly due to the green quality, but we're still learning how to separate the effects and how to best judge what coffees to buy because we have to be mindful of the fact that our roasting may have influenced which coffee we buy and that, that would be unfortunate. Right, right. So we're talking about when we were talking about roast curves, we were talking about the fact that you're getting the temperature reading from the exterior of the bean. And part of the goal of doing this is to have a well-developed coffee. Um, in, in the book, you talk about the development time ratio as a tool you can mm-hmm. use to help achieve something uh, like that. So talk to us about what that is and how we should uh, use that in our roasting. Sure. So it, it's actually a good question and, and a controversial one. So when I wrote my first roasting book, I, I developed the idea. I hadn't labeled it development time ratio yet, but I developed the idea of looking at the last section of a roast, the, the time from the beginning of first crack to the end of the roast as a ratio, not just as quote unquote development time, because up until then, nobody had ever looked at it in terms of ratios. Everyone would just say, oh, I'm three minutes in this phase, three minutes in this phase, blah, blah, blah. Um, the the benefit of seeing it as a ratio is just to get a better sense of whether your curve is in balance. And what I mean by that is that if you spend, you know, five minutes up to in, in what people call the drying phase, and if you spend five minutes in the what people call the Maillard phase, and then you you spend one minute after first crack in the development phase, that's a very strange roast curve that's that's you know, may not taste so great and, and there may be a predictable pattern to to those ratios and, and how the coffee tastes. But development time ratio is not as useful as I'd like it to be in terms of either predicting development or even or even implying how dark a coffee is, because you could easily reach 25% development time ratio before first crack is over, and you could reach 20% uh, at the very end of first crack, depending on how you how you roast. So uh, that's that's to say that there's a correlation, but it's very loose. And I like I would like it if people would look at development time ratio in conjunction with curve shape in order to to get some to to infer some ideas about the roast. So what I mean by that is that if I have a perfectly smoothly declining ROR and and it ends with a twenty percent DTR that is going to be a radically different cup of coffee than the same roast that had a big crash and flick in the ROR and ended up at the same color and the same DTR. So it, they took two radically different paths to get to a 20% DTR, and they are going to taste very different. I'm not going to predict which one's going to uh, be more developed, but I'll say that the one that crashed and flicked will taste more baked and roasty, and the one that came down smoothly probably has a better chance, although it's not guaranteed, a better chance of being, say, juicier and, and sweeter and rounder. So DTR is is limited in its use, and I think it requires that you have a certain standard for your curve shape when you um, consider what the DTR means to the coffee. Standard as in um, a curve shape that you're always going for? 
a, a curve shape that's that's quote unquote reasonable in, in the sense that you know if you have a curve shape that's all over the map, it's 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 rising before it first crack, it's crashing hard, it's flicking. I don't care anymore what your DTR is or almost anything else because those those movements of the curve are going to have a very predictable negative effect on on your coffee. Right. So you're stable. So, you're stabilizing one thing in order to make another possible. Right. Right. And I, I unfortunately I see this oftentimes with new clients where they're so obsessed with hitting a certain DTR that they are not focused on the curve, which probably has more impact on flavor. And again, you know, roasting's a, a system where you really need to see it as a system and not as a bunch of you know linear variables like you need to be able to juggle all of these ideas in your head at the same time and say i have to i have to care about the tr and i have to care about the curve shape and i have to care about the final temperature like i can't just focus on one and forget the others right and then of course there's the between batch protocols that would impact you know how those things flow throughout the production day too i guess like how do you suggest Absolutely. people uh take that on it, it is interesting because when people don't have a good between batch protocol and the machine starts out at somewhat random temperatures each time you put a batch in, you might achieve what look like the kind of curves you want, but your cup results are going to vary a lot. And so to me, the definition of a successful between batch protocol is that your roast curve, if you use the same gas settings and airflow settings for, for the same coffee, same batch size consecutive times, your roast curves would do what we call tracing each other. They would they would overlap each other so perfectly that there's no daylight between them when you when they're both on the same graph, and that would imply that your between batch protocol was was successful. But if the between batch protocol say left the machine a little too hot after the second batch, you know before the second batch relative to the first batch, then the the turning point in the early part of the curve would definitely be a bit higher in the second batch than the first batch. Exceptions to the rules, well, somebody might have a roast curve that doesn't track like that, but the coffee to them tastes amazing. And they, I can see, sure. probably would say, well, see, you don't have to do that. I mean, what would you say to that person? Sure. So so you and I have already been uh, through that that discussion and that journey back in the 90s with, with espresso, right? People would people would do pretty wacky things to quote unquote dial in their espresso in the morning in a cafe. Oh yeah. Right. I remember one, one well-known third wave company, their baristas were very proud that it took them 45 minutes to dial in their espresso each morning. And I thought, what are you, what are you doing for 45 minutes? And, and it turned out that they were, they were changing the dose. They were changing the water temperature. They were changing their ratio. They were literally just throwing all the variables into the air and seeing how they landed and trying that, that system and then change it to another one and they have no no anchor basically so if you have a, a unsuccessful between batch protocol you could have two different curves and you could think they both taste amazing but my message to people would be any any system could conceivably give you a good result but as, as a business and as someone who wants success to happen almost all the time, not just randomly, I would strongly recommend finding a system that achieves predictability and consistency because without that, you'll you'll end up going in circles. You probably won't make much progress in the long run and you'll frustrate your customers because one day the Kenya will taste sparkly and fruity and amazing and one day it'll taste kind of roasty or vegetal or something. And and at least on a business level, that's that's not a great plan. Um, I, I do think if I can editorialize, I think there's a lot of roasters who enjoy that process of exploration and experimentation to such a degree that they're kind of anti-systematic and they're more interested in, in exploring how every lever they pull can affect the coffee than they are in achieving this sort of nirvana of consistently excellent, predictable results. Okay. So I think there's, it's yeah. a bit of a drug. To, to the excitement of, hey, look what I just did. I just tried something new and, and I got a new result and this is really cool. You know, that that's that's addictive. So, and I, I get it. I mean, that, that is fun. And I, I do enjoy that process, but I I tend to use that process on the side, like maybe in the sample roaster, maybe on, on certain coffees where I feel kind of free to experiment with, you know, more so than other coffees. And I, I try to keep anything that I'm selling or anything that's quite precious. I try to be very systematic and careful with it. I'd rather... I'd rather hit an eight out of 10 all day long than, than have a bunch of fives and a bunch of nines and tens 
jumbled up together, you know, just, just, uh, and that's my preference, you know, but, but that's, that's the way I see it in terms of being systematic. Right. Okay. I mean, that's, uh, some, it's something that influences the market in the end, right? There's a downstream effect sure. for our inconsistencies, um, beyond just the fact that we might frustrate our customers. I mean, uh, have you, I guess over the years, you must have seen this trend in the industry. Are, are we becoming more consistent in what we present to the customer? Or is the proliferation of both roasters and types of equipment and tools creating more inconsistencies than they were actually designed to prevent? So I, I think the trend is in our favor. I think it's becoming more consistent, both in terms of roasting and brewing. Uh, it's a little bit like the stock market where... The long, long-term trend is up, but in the short run, it, it seems kind of random. Like, you know, there's been, I'm sure you've seen it too. There's been periods where everyone wanted to pull over stretto or everybody wanted to underdevelop their coffee or, or something like that. And then the pendulum swung a little bit, but the, the long-term trend has zeroed in, I think, on, on better practices and more consistency. Oh, um, good. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I, I think, you know, I, What's interesting, though, is I think we've all become pickier over the years, too. So although everything's getting a little better in terms of quality and consistency, I think our standards keep rising for those things. And it gets it, it doesn't get any easier to be satisfied, even though things have improved. I tend to think some of that is due to how connected we are, where, you know, this has been talked about by a lot of people of uh, I'd say my age group, you know, you and I are are part of that like early uh, coffee uh, world, and mm. at least in the early 2000s for me in the late 1990s. But um, when you found mm. out that somebody was a, a specialty coffee uh, shop in a city, like no matter what was happening, you kind of dropped what you were doing and went there to do a pilgrimage <laughs> yes. to the place, right? And because it yes. was so unlike, it was almost like if you found somebody that was into model trains, like how, what the, what's the likelihood? Um, now yeah. it's not so much that way, but we have subscriptions. So where now things have become more ubiquitous in the cities, we're like, oh, but now I can kind of quote unquote go to other cities and order coffee from Dublin mm. and California, from New York and um, so we've got all these different roasters to compare ourselves to. Um, I mean, is is there a good way to just incorporate that you know, like comparison of like where you stand in the industry, uh, like on a re- pretty regular basis, like comparing ourselves against others? I guess it could go a pretty, um, it could go overboard, but uh, uh, certainly there must be a reasonable <laughs> yes, yes. inclusion of of comparing yourself against your industry peers. So how do we you know do that? I've met a lot of roasters and a lot of clients who kind of have intentionally avoided cupping other people's copies because they didn't want to be shown up amongst their staff or, or just themselves. And and I think there's there's wonderful value in blindly putting similar copies from other roasters on the table, mixing it up, and then and then finding out like oh because because I always. I get a lot of, um, I'll tell you a funny story to, to illustrate the point. I, I think a lot of people are, are a little bit high on their own supply. Like, you know, we all kind of like our own product a little better than other people's products, but maybe not objectively, you know? Um, but I did a consulting job once where I, I was a little frustrated because the client was wanting help, but also frequently telling me that his copy was like amazing. And, and I, I was like, you know, I, I don't think you really want to change. Like, I don't, I'm, and that's okay. But I, I, he just, you know, he was so happy with his coffee. I didn't really know what I was doing there. Um, but uh, I wasn't, I wasn't that happy with his coffee. And um, I, on the way to, to the job on, on my second day, I stopped at um, uh, Dunkin' Donuts and I got a cup of coffee and I brought it to his business and I, I dropped the Duncan quietly into a, one of his cups and I, I handed it to him and he drank it and he loved it. And he was like, Oh, that's like the best it's been in a long time or whatever. And I said, well, uh, I have to tell you, it's from Dunkin' Donuts down the street. Wow. It's and dirty, Scott. Oh my talking? gosh. I know. I know. But it's, this is, this is like the way I see it is, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't embarrass him. I didn't do it in front of anyone else, but I, I wasn't getting through to him that there was improvement to make. And, and I was frustrated that he was wasting his money on me 
software consulting that he that he wasn't necessarily interested in in having. And um, so yes, it was a dirty trick. And the fascinating thing was that for about a half hour, he was very motivated by that. He was like, "Wow, if we're not better than Dustin, we got we got to do some work." And then a half hour later, he he reiterated that he had the best coffee in town, and it was like that event sort of never happened. Um, oh wow! And okay. um, and there is some there is something there. I've had, I've had a similar experience several times where um, I get it. Like most of us want to feel proud of what we put out there, and and we should. Uh, but I think there's sort of like the the hat you wear when you're a consumer or you're enjoying your product, and there's the hat you wear when you're trying to improve your product. And I think sometimes it would be nice to to or ideal to kind of separate and, and make sure you know which hat you're wearing at, at various times in order to do the best job you can. Um, but you know, I, I'd say as a, as a small roastery, it would be a great practice to say you know once a week you're going to buy a bag or two of coffee from from a competitor or from a admired roaster. And uh, preferably of a coffee that's that's similar, like let's say you've got a washed Kenya, they've got a washed Kenya, they've got a natural Ethiopian, you've got a natural Ethiopian, like buy buy analogous coffees, cup them blindly so that you don't know, have have somebody else set up the cupping table, you don't know how many cups and which cups and all that kind of thing, and and give it an honest assessment. And I think I think there's a ton to learn from that, and and doing it once a week would be would be a great start. So we've talked about a lot of things here, and uh, a lot of it's proven out through the years of uh, developing these best practices through um, trial and error. And, you know, we're in the midst of probably a lot of things that we're going to see as errors in the future uh, right now. But uh, what would you say is the most controversial or most closely held belief in roasting that you think is kind of dead wrong right now and why? And will that be something that gets disproven or is in the process of being disproven currently? Mm, that's an that's a, that's a interesting and, and difficult question. Um, I think that this is, this is going, to, this is one of the things I'm, I'm always hesitant to say publicly because um, especially with social media these days, pe- people often like to reduce what you say to a soundbite that, that suddenly is not what you meant, you know? Um, Okay, remember remember when um, kind of pre-refractometer days, people would be making espresso and they'd be changing their recipes and their systems for different coffees. And, and the mantra was always like, depends on the coffee, depends on the coffee, depends on the coffee. And and again, I wasn't really necessarily sure, well, well, what is it about the coffee that makes it depend on the coffee? Is it the roast level? Is it the varietal? Is it something else? Like, we know it depends on the coffee, but what does that mean? Like, like tell it to me in a way that makes sense, right? That's useful. Now, the same thing in roasting where I'm, I'm not going to argue that you should roast all coffees the same. Absolutely not. But I do think, and this is controversial, that you can approach all coffees with the same system and the same mentality in the sense that you could use the same batch size, the same between batch protocol, similar but not identical settings. You could attempt to achieve the same curve shape whether it's a natural, whether it's a washed, whether it's a, a low-grown Sumatra, whether it's a Kenya, and you can achieve success with that. I think that there's still this, the depends on the coffee mentality takes people to a place where they're, they're starting out too randomly. And I, I do think you really need a system. And I always worry about talking about this because I think people will say, oh, Scott Rayo says you have to roast all coffees the same. And, and that's really not what I'm saying, and, and that, that's I get accused of that sometimes, but it's it's more it's more like you need very it's 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 like brewing, right? In brewing, you might need a different grind setting, you might need a slightly different approach for for various coffees, but at the end of the day, the best practices in puck prep or or in pouring a V60 are are about the same no matter what coffee you're putting in there. And I think that the best practices in roasting are also pretty much the same no matter what the coffee is, but you have to decide which variables are worth adjusting for for different coffees and i think you really only have to at the, at the minimum you have to just adjust the gas settings and nothing else and you could successfully implement a system for every different type of coffee wow. um but i read all the time online that you have to roast natural different than washed coffees and all this and i i don't think that's true i just think that you need different settings to achieve a, a similar end result in terms of color and development and whatnot oh the controversy I know, I know, and I'd love to. I'd love to throw in the addendum that I I, I love the the saying that you know I, I have strong opinions loosely held, 
Um, mm. I, I, I've been accused of, of being many things, but I, I, I sincerely and, and heartfelt, you know, I have a heartfelt belief that I really care about finding what's true. I know I'm wrong about everything, just like everyone's effectively wrong about everything. Like, you know, 20 years ago, we had a whole bunch of beliefs about roasting. And you know what? They've all been replaced. And 20 years from now, I'm, I'm going to be replaced by a, my ideas will be replaced by a whole set of ideas that, that run contrary to it. But I love it if people keep an open mind that this is a journey of exploration. And the fact that it's a journey and the fact that we're making mistakes all the time, it doesn't mean we should reject science. It doesn't mean we should reject data. It means we have to use every tool at our disposal, including tasting data, science, systems in order to make progress and we are making progress but you know much like with the coronavirus like people love to pick on science and say see science got it wrong we shouldn't look at we shouldn't care what science said about masks or anything else it's like science isn't a religion science is something that is a work in progress and and that's that's how i feel about roasting and brewing and everything else and that's that's the only reason i stick with it is is that the exciting part is to keep learning and problem solving and I don't at all think I have all the answers. I just have a lot of questions and a lot of experience and a lot of suggestions, and those will evolve over time, I hope. Absolutely. And yeah, well said. Uh, there's a lot more in the book that uh, we no way have had time to cover on the show, but um, I'm, I'm really excited to have gotten the opportunity to have this discussion with you. It's definitely uh, intriguing and uh, well done again on the book. And thanks for joining me too. It's really great to catch hey, up. Hey, thanks for inviting me. It's it's a pleasure. And uh, and and also, like honestly, your your questions were awesome. I've been on many podcasts and we've they've gone in all different directions, but like <laughs> you really you really did your research, and I think I really appreciate the conversation. Oh yeah, my pleasure. And where can people go to uh, learn more? You know, stay in touch with you and get this book. Uh, the best places to find me and my work are www.scottrayo.com or Instagram. I'm at, I'm at where is Scott Rayo, R-A-O. Um, I like to post a lot of uh, coffee tips on Instagram and, and hopefully generate some conversation there. And it, it's kind of an, like an easy, easy way to discuss some relatively high level coffee issues. So thanks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. What I personally took away from this conversation is that we should be constantly learning. And as Scott said, have our strong opinions held loosely so that while we are practicing certain things in our roastery, we are also asking questions of what we're practicing and be willing to change as evidence supports that change as we do our due diligence to examine what we're doing and constantly try to represent the coffee in its best possible light through our best practices in roasting. So a huge thank you to Scott Rayo for joining us on the show. You can find out more information about Scott and buy his book over at scottrayo.com. And you should also follow him on Instagram at where is Scott Rayo. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, feel free to email me. That's chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, another place that you can learn about best practices in the coffee industry, if you're interested in learning how to be a great coffee retailer, is Coffee Fest. Uh, coffee Fest is happening four times this year, San Antonio, Atlanta, Anaheim, and Portland, Oregon. I will be at all four shows. I've been going to Coffee Fest for the past, oh, how many years it's been, since 2004. And I'll tell you that no other event gives you more value than Coffee Fest. If your goal is to learn and grow as a coffee retail professional, there's an amazing array of free lectures, affordable workshops. There's the cold brew competition, latte art competition, and of course, the trade show floor with a ton of amazing vendors. Coffee Fest has been going on for over 25 years, and they really want to see you there. So if you're interested in going to Coffee Fest this year, go check out the website over at coffeefest.com. And also stay tuned for Coffee Fest 365, which is their new online learning platform coming soon. There's going to be a ton of great content there. Again, find out more information at coffeefest.com. And I do hope to see you at one of these shows this year. And with that, that is the end of our episode, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Keys to the Shop, for joining me today. I hope you got a lot from this conversation with Scott Rayo. Have a wonderful day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.